Okay, welcome everybody to the Applied Math and Statistics Global. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Miller from University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. She is a professor of biology and mathematics at UNC. She is the recipient of the Burroughs Welcome Award and an SF <coughs> Career Award. And today she's going to tell us about using computational fluid dynamics instead of jellyfish. Right. Thanks, friend. So, uh, yeah, it's been great to be here and to see where friend has landed and also Cecilio, who I've known for a long time. And uh, so I'm going to tell you today about jellyfish and hopefully show you some beautiful pictures and movies since it's Friday afternoon. Um, and then talk about some of the mathematical challenges as well. And uh, the people who um, have helped out are from fields of mathematics, biology, physics, mechanical engineering, oceanography, so it's really been an interdisciplinary project. And um, a lot of different work to come to together to try to understand jellyfish swimming and also pulsing and soft corals. So I'll tell you a little bit about them at the end. So the uh, first part of the talk, um, our goal in my group for the past six years or so has been to try to create an integrative model of jellyfish swimming, looking from the activation of the muscle to the way the active force is applied to the elastic jellyfish to how it swims through the fluid and eventually how it senses its environment and maneuvers. Um, and there's a lot of variation in jellyfish. I'm going to talk about Skykazoan moon jellyfish, which um, their behavior isn't that complex relative to other animals or jellyfish. Uh, we have started thinking a bit about box jellyfish that have eyes and actively hunt, but for right now, uh, we're starting simple. And there are a lot of reasons I think that jellyfish are a nice organism to start with. And um, a lot of the computational work is that was done by Alex Huber, who's now a postdoc at Tulane and was a graduate student with me. And um, we have a number of motivating questions, and I'll talk about two of them today. So the first is looking at how the elastic properties of the bell enhance swimming performance. So rather than just saying jellyfish move like this and we impose that movement and see what the fluid does, how do these elastic properties either enhance or reduce swimming effectiveness? And then how do these jellyfish adjust their behavior to maneuver or turn? And um, eventually we'd like to ask and we have started to ask some questions about translating neural signals into modes of locomotion and how the properties in muscle like force length relationships and force velocity relationships affect uh, their swimming performance. And this is a newer area of research with other groups um, who are also looking at this problem in other organisms. An example is the lamprey, so Eric Titel, Lisa Fauci, Avis Cullen, and a large group of uh, interdisciplinary people have been looking at lamprey. And the idea is that you have central pattern generators that drive the swimming motion. Those activate muscles to contract. That moves the elastic lamprey body. It pushes the fluid, it moves through the fluids, and then there's feedback at every level um, to adjust the behavior to swim faster or to maneuver. So with jellyfish, um, which is a different target, target organism that has um, some advantages and disadvantages, uh, one nice thing about them is that engineers are beginning to study them to think about how we might design different types of uh, underwater vehicles, particularly ones that slowly sample the fluid uh, in ocean exploration. So there are some examples of a uh, robot jellyfish inspired by the real things. Um, and because of that, there have been a lot of really good studies measuring the elastic properties of jellyfish and their swimming behaviors. And this falls within a bigger field of bio-inspired design, uh, looking at how we might make better robots based off what we can learn from animals. Now, from uh, my point of view, I really like working on jellyfish because of their relative simplicity. And there are a lot of mathematicians in fluid dynamics who work on jellyfish proportionally way more than in biology. So in the field of biology, jellyfish aren't particularly well studied. In math, they are. And if you think about why, 
If you're going to make a model, you can approximate these guys as a hemiolepse. They have this nice structure. They have simple behavior. They only have two groups of muscles, so a coronal swimming muscle that runs around the margin, and then some radial muscles. They don't have any bones or joints, um, and they don't have a brain, so to speak. They have pacemakers that trigger the contraction of the swimming muscle. So relative to a fish or something else you might model, you can really start asking questions about the interaction between the elastic body and the muscle, given the simplicity, and of course, in some cases, you can assume that they're actually symmetric and so forth. Um, so those are all really nice things. And there's also really interesting fluid dynamics. And I think for some reason when I was saving this movie in a different format, I lost a lot of the quality. This was from John DeBerry, and this is a moon jellyfish. Dye was injected on the top of the bell. And, um, this over. So during each pulse, you can see a vortex ring that is formed and separates from the bell. There's also an oppositely spinning vortex ring that forms during the expansion. So what happens is the jellyfish uh, bell expands and you have a vortex ring that forms. It contracts and an oppositely spinning vortex ring forms. And you end up with these vortex ring pairs that are let's see, counterclockwise and clockwise, and that helps to uh, redirect the fluid down into the jet, and it enhances the jet and provides extra momentum to the jellyfish, and here's just a cartoon from one of Tiberi's papers on that. So if you're interested in vortex rings, it's a nice problem. They are also very nice to look at in the lab because you can shine lasers at them, and you know, if they don't mind, <laughs> and you can, one of my uh, students actually, I think, uh, had a jellyfish in a tank for like eight hours straight and was just flashing lasers to track the motion of the water. And the jellyfish was fine. It was relatively unharmed. So with fish, you have to train them not to, you know, swim into the laser and they freak out. And, so this uh, was done by an undergrad in the lab who's a math bio double major. And uh, she's using particle image relative symmetry, so you might see some glass beads. And so as the jellyfish swims, uh, you can compare frame to frame where those beads have moved and reconstruct these velocity fields. Now, uh, everything I showed you so far are moon jellyfish, which are probably the best studied jellyfish in terms of locomotion. And um, that's probably because they're easy to keep, relatively speaking, and you can order them online and have them fed up. And for like, no other reason than that. Um, so, and they swim using this paddling locomotion that you just saw. There are also these uh, ones that swim using jet propulsion and they're ambush predators. This is a hydromedusa. Box jellyfish swim similarly. And what's going to happen is someone's going to inject some milk, actually, into the bell and disturb the jellyfish, and it will start uh, swimming. So during the first contraction, you can see that the vortex rings are ejected very far downstream. And you don't have these pairs of interacting vortex rings or the vortex rings interacting with the bell. And that becomes important in terms of some uh, results that I'll show you later, just these inherent differences in vortex ring interactions with each other and with the organism itself. Okay, so then, like I mentioned before, they're nice because they have one band this muscular ring of coronal muscles, and then radial muscles, and oftentimes you can ignore the radial muscle. So you basically have an elastic uh, hemiellipse with one band of muscle. And the muscle contracts, and when it relaxes, there's a passive elastic recoil. So again, a simple behavior, simple to think about uh, modeling. And there have been models that go everywhere from lump parameters to vortex sheet, vortex particles, to full uh, CFD solving the Navier-Stokes equations. 
Now their nervous system, so this is the one downside. Um, it is simple, but it is not well understood or well studied. There is one person right now in the US who really works on jellyfish neurobio, and he is at UNC Wilmington, and he is almost retired and prefers to write mystery novels these days. <laughs> so you can try to find him to ask questions, but um, if he has a new book coming out, you know, it's not going to work so well. But, um, <laughs> So, and I think he has a jellyfish mystery as well. I haven't read any of these books, but... Um, okay, so the jellyfish have two nervous systems. There are diffuse nerve nets. There's a, the diffuse nerve net, which takes in sensory information. Is it hitting a wall? Is it cold? Is there shear? Again, not really so well understood. And then a motor nerve net, which is basically the pacemakers and the nerves that run over these coronal swimming muscles. The pacemakers are synchronized when they fire together. They send uh, action potentials along the motor nerve net that goes over the muscle, and the muscle just uh, symmetrically squeezes or contracts. And then the diffuse nerve net is somehow potentially decoupling the pacemakers when the jellyfish wants to turn or uh, slowing down the pulsing frequency when it's resting or cruising. So a simple nervous system, but again, one that really isn't well studied or understood. And these jellyfish have eight pacemakers, so again, they're weakly coupled, fire together, and the jellyfish moves forward, uh, decouple, and you get turns. In other types of jellyfish, the nervous system can be really quite different, actually. Are those pacemakers where the, like the cusps of this, this perimeter? Uh, yes. The mm -hmm. And if that has any functional significance, I don't think anyone really knows. So um, what I'm going to show you first are um, our attempts at just modeling forward swimming. Um, and then we'll move into changing some elastic properties of the bell and turning. So we start with this moon jellyfish that is thicker on top than at the margin if we make an elastic bell, just the neobocane material that is thicker on top than the sides. And then for the coronal swimming muscles, we basically have a distribution of uh, muscle activation, so we apply an active tension to the bell. And then we put this in uh, a fluid and we saw the full Navier-Stokes equation. So um, I actually, gave a talk similar to this yesterday and had a lot of questions on whether or not you had to solve the full Navier-Stokes equations. So there are other folks who are making you know, implicit assumptions and using vortex sheets or vortex particles, and it's faster, but you, there are tricks like how, when the vortex rings separate and how they decay that are hard to intuit ahead of time, so you have to be checking against either experiments or full CFD to make these corrections, I would say. Um, so I have had a project with Silas Alden where I do the full CFD and he does vortex sheets and we try to make them match, and it isn't easy, so I'll, I'll say that. But things could be faster if you're able to, wait, able to get away with some of these tricks. But, for me, uh, what I'll show you today is we're solving full Navier Stokes. We use the Morse boundary method, so we solve the Navier Stokes equations on a fixed Cartesian grid. We solve the elasticity equations on a moving curvilinear mesh. For the Navier Stokes lower cases on the Cartesian grid, we solve velocity pressure and uh, use the elasticity equations to get a force that's applied to the fluid. Capital letters are uh, for the Lagrangian description of the elastic boundary. X gives you the Cartesian coordinate of position R along this curvilinear uh, mesh, and then force is that elastic force. And so you have to have two ways, or you have to have some way for when you discretize this for the grids to talk to each other, the Morse boundary way, and again, there are many other ways to do this. This gets done through uh, integral equations with delta function transforms. And again, we're solving the full nonlinear Navier Stokes equation. So if I break down the numerical method, uh, why these are challenging, 
So you're solving the navier stokes equation on an Euler-Polarian grid. You go into 3D, and <clears throat> oftentimes you have to use a pretty fine mesh close to the uh, jellyfish. And if it was uniform, you might have a 512 cubed grid. Um, and then the time steps, you might be taking 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth time steps to get a number of pulses. So these simulations end up taking days on the cluster. So at each time step, solve an average stokes, move your boundary at the local fluid velocity, look at the deformation of the boundary, solve your elasticity equations to figure out the force acting on the boundary, equal and opposite forces applied to the fluid. And the error that gets introduced using Haskins and Merce boundary method is a lot from the force spreading. So imagine here's part of your curvilinear mesh. This boundary is resisting bending. This wants to be straight, so a force gets applied in the fluid in this direction as you have to move the fluid with the boundary to straighten it out. Um, and so you end up using this uh, discrete del function to do your spreading. So the force that you calculate at this uh, grid point gets applied to local fluid grid points, which has the effect of smearing out the boundary. So this works pretty well if you're at lower Reynolds numbers with thick boundary layers, which the jellyfish we're looking at are, if you try to get up to really large scales with thin boundary layers, you run into problems and you have to use really fine grids. And there are a lot of methods people are working on to do this better, but since we're in 3D um, and we need a, adaptive mesh refinement and parallelization, uh, we are using a code that's available that as far as I know for <coughs> other methods people use is not really avail openly available. So, um, and Corinne and I had this discussion about whether or not to use this code and um, so anyway, it's always a challenge, right, trading off these different costs. So you've also got to uh, interpolate the boundary at the local fluid velocity, and you can do this basically as a weighted sum of the velocities of surrounding grid points. You do it in 3D, so if you're in 2D, you can write your own code, and it's fine. It will take a couple hours for the simulations to run. If you're in 3D for these types of problems, you really need adaptive mesh refinement and uh, parallelized code. So we use Voice Purpose Code, who's at uh, UNC, and Voice has probably spent 15 years, I would say, developing this uh, code. And so here is our swimming jellyfish, and the uh, grid where we're solving Navier Stokes is refined near the jellyfish and near interesting regions of fluid motion, like the vortex rings. So my 2D code that I wrote as a grad student, it took, I have five days to do eight pulses on a desktop, and that was 2D, um, so I couldn't do 3D. So Voices code takes on a cluster with 64 nodes a day or two to do eight pulses. So huge speed up, but then again, he spent like over a decade uh, coding this up, so, and I, I did not want to do that because I wanted to look at jellyfish <coughs> and go scoop something. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, it's not trivial to learn his code, and also you have to, you have to figure out your own ways of what are your muscle models, what are your neural models, your elasticity models, how do you move the jellyfish, so there is still a lot of work to do, but his code is online on GitHub, and I have a bunch of tutorials if anyone is interested in checking it out. Um, so this is what he provides now to your stone solvers, <laughs> velocity interpolation and force spreading, and AMR for the fluid solver. What you provide is your elastic model, which could be beams, springs, um, nonlinear springs, what have you, or a continuum model. Uh, you have to make your own mesh, which gets harder in 3D. And you have to figure out how you're moving the boundary, which again can require muscle models, biochemistry, um, preferred curvature, and so forth. Okay, so using that, um, we have considered a couple different ways of activating the muscle. 
on the left, we actually have eight pacemakers, which we are right now just prescribing that they activate. And then there is a wave of activation that spreads out from each of the pacemakers. And if they're synchronized, then you get forward swimming. And you can see the little dimples that sort of correspond to the differential activation times between each of those eight pacemakers. You can also um, just have a uniform activation wave that you turn on and off. So in these simulations, all we're prescribing are these activation patterns uh, that then apply force to the boundary, and so everything, the movement of the bell and how it swims through the fluid emerges from these equations. Can you say a little more about the actual elastic part? Is it, is it, is it infinitesimally thin? No, so not for these, for some of the simulations it is. Uh, so the initial simulations, it's an infinitely thin boundary, it resists bending and stretching. Um, for the simulations Alex has done, its uh, voice has this hybrid immersed boundary finite element, so it's a finite element volume that... Is it isotropic? Which the jellyfish are not, so that's another improvement. Uh, I, no, I don't know anything about jellyfish. But... Jellyfish material properties are really complicated, actually, and uh, but we ignore that right now. So, But I think eventually we'll have to consider it. You mentioned that you looked at nonlinear spring models, so like um, non hookian ones. Did you do comparisons between the two? And if so, um, how did the dynamics, how are the dynamics affected? So I have not done, so okay. I've said, like one could do that, okay. and other people have, and I have not done okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> but that, it, it's interesting, you know, when does that matter? And how, you know, nonlinear does it need to be? Yeah. So it is on linear because of the deformations, but it's not like a strain hardening material or something like that. So it's not non-linear in that aspect. Yeah. When the muscles are contracting on the two of these, is the right side contracting uniformly all the way around the bell? Is that what you're saying, by the way? Uh, yeah, so this is just, we have applied the tension at the same time everywhere around the entire bell. So uh, why does it still have points of like tension? Oh, like, so like, there is out. buckling that happens from, so you apply the tension and then you release, and you end up with these buckling patterns due to the large deformation and the fluid structure interaction that we still don't really understand that well. You do see it in the actual jellyfish, though, that, that they also have these buckling patterns. Okay, so um, just to remind you, forward swimming jellyfish, the real one, before I show you ours. And, okay, so here is our <clears throat> my pointer. To start the movies, it's not working so well. Okay, so here are uh, vorticity contours, so you can see the vortex rings that are generated and affected away from the jellyfish. And again, we're, say, we're applying the tension, we're moving it in a way that is uh, close to what's been estimated for moon jellyfish. The motion of the fluid in the jellyfish emerges from these simulations. And if we compare to uh, real jellyfish, so this is in meters per second and this is in millimeters, so 0 0.3 is equal to 30. So we're getting a quantitatively pretty close agreement. The waveforms are similar. You might notice these big peaks here. So this is a contraction, relaxation, and rest. And there are some wobbles, which you also see in the real jellyfish. But um, this is likely primarily due to the, um, the bell wobbling. So it contracts, expands, and then it oscillates. And uh, jellyfish bells are highly viscoelastic, and we are incorporating that. So we probably need to do that to if we want to better match what's happening here and here. Um, here is the distance traveled over time. And in the real jellyfish, so the yellow bands correspond to where they're coasting. So they contracted, expanded, and then they're resting, but they still coast forward. And we get that once we reach periodic steady state as well. Um, 
and then if we look at the shape, so again, these guys actually, if you look closely, aren't really a hemi ellipse. So there are some differences, but um, again, it's doing a pretty good job forward swimming, same speed, same pattern, and so on. Okay, so um, now we're going to look at what does the, uh, how does the elastic modulus affect its swimming? And um, so there was a hypothesis proposed in the 80s about jellyfish swimming that um, if the jellyfish muscle contracts at the resonant frequency of the bell, that the jellyfish will swim faster. So the idea is that you're resonating the bell, the amplitude of oscillation is larger. It expels more fluid from the cavity because it's moving more and squeezing more. Um, and so this is when you should have the highest swimming speeds. So this isn't always true in fish. So if you resonate a fish, it might not swim the fastest or in insect wings. And there's a trade-off because even though the bell is opening and closing and pumping all this water, it's also increasing its drag by you know, hyperextending too. So is this really going to do better? In the 80s, they had a lump parameter model spring mass damper basically where force is coming from the volume expelled and stiffness was you know lump parameter elasticity of the bell and then mass came from the added mass of the fluid in the jellyfish and so they predicted that it did swim fastest and so this is a cute movie just to show you sort of how you get bigger oscillations if you resonate something and so if you switch on the swing at the right time, you get bigger and bigger oscillations. And then if you push at the wrong time or too fast and everything stops, which it is sort of amazing just how quickly you can stop. <laughs> <laughs> and then you end up with someone who's quite <laughs> The first simulations I'll show you are in 2D, and we're looking at prolate bells that use jet propulsion. And this was before we had been in 3D, and some earlier work had shown that we really can't capture uh, oblate jellyfish, like new jellyfish, swimming in 2D unless it's axisymmetric, but at the time we weren't doing axisymmetric. Um, and that is partially because uh, in 2D, you don't have vortex rings. You've got basically what's equivalent to uh, rigid vortex cylinders moving out of the into the third dimension, and the interaction of those vortices is different if they're rings because they're stretching and so forth. So the interaction of the rings and the bell matters for oblates, and it doesn't for prolates. And we can get away with 2D for prolates. So we did this study in 2D with prolates. Um, and uh, essentially what we did here is a cross section of the bell and we apply a force, a sinusoidal force to the bottom of the bell, which is a little bit artificial too because it's like you're squeezing it and then you're pulling it open and squeezing it and pulling it open and the jellyfish muscles don't pull it back open, they just squeeze. But this was similar to that one parameter model with the sinusoidal force. We figured out what the resonant frequency was by squeezing the bell and releasing it, and then measuring the time it took to complete a full oscillation. And it's hard to know exactly what that's going to be ahead of time because the mass is due to the added mass of the bell, which is going to be a function of the Reynolds number and the velocity of the bell, which is complicated if like the velocity is changing and so forth. So we just did the, well, what is this frequency since we have the simulation running? And um, so here are our results. So this is the forward, average forward swimming velocity. As you move across, we're increasing the magnitude of the force, so we get bigger bell oscillations. The dashed line is when the bell was driven at the resonant frequency. And the colors in each graph are the uh, average over different periods. So if here, this is the fifth pulse, this is the 10th. So it does take a while for them to reach periodic steady state. Um, but regardless, once you do hit that uh, periodic steady state, the fastest swimming speeds are indeed uh, when you're 
driving the bell near its resonant frequency, even over a large range of uh, forces. Now we can also look at uh, the distance traveled per pulse or per period in a single period. Um, and again, it's close, so at lower frequencies, it's doing a little bit better. Um, the power input also is highest at the uh, resonant frequency, so the bell is really moving with the large velocity, doing these greater amplitude oscillations. Um, and then if you look at the cost of transport, so like this is a normalized power input over why you like travel, uh, you have this relatively flat plateau at lower frequencies, and then once you drive a lot higher than the resonant frequency, you have a really high cost of transport. Okay, so um, this again though was for prolates and a uh, competing idea in the literature, which if I go back really quickly here, is that this might not be the case for oblate jellyfish because they can coast. And so um, in addition to larger amplitude oscillations, uh, maybe lower frequencies or yeah, lower frequencies will take advantage of they pulse and then they coast for a while. Um, so we, our collaborators had suggested this to us, and eventually, using Boyce's code, we were in three dimensions, and we repeated the study where we took our elastic bell, we deformed it, and let it oscillate, figured out what the frequency of free vibration was, and then applied the tension at that frequency. So at this point, we were working with um, people in marine bio and biogeography departments, and they really didn't like that sinusoidal force that was like opening the bell and closing the bell. So we did something a little more realistic where we had a fixed duration of applied active tension. So the jellyfish, when they contract their muscles, it's going to be for, it's the same pulse, at least in this, in these guys, a contraction is more or less the same, the same duration, the same. Uh, magnitude, and then we varied the time between these active pulses, and this is also how these moon jellyfish will adjust their frequency. So again, there was no active opening the bell, and the only thing that we were changing was the time in between active contractions, and that's how we varied the uh, frequency. So this graph is showing you the vortex wake and uh, if you start at zero, how far the jellyfish traveled after four pulses. So it isn't the same amount of time, but it's the same number of pulses. And as you move from left to right, um, the uh, period between active contraction grows. So this guy is being driven at its resonant frequency. It contracts, it expands, you contract it again, it expands. And these guys, there's that resting period in between before the next active contraction, and they really are coasting during that time for free. So they are getting farther per active pulse. Um, here, if we look at the average speed over one pulse, and the different colors are different bell stiffnesses, and one is uh, the resonant frequency. So there is this peak in average swimming speed when you drive them at resonance. Here is the cost of transport again and uh, different uh, stiffnesses, but in, in either case, you end up with these lower costs of transport because you're allowing the jellyfish to coast and to passively recapture some of the energy from the vortices. All right, so it's slightly different results for prolates and uh, oblates. And again, do you want to be fast or do you want to be efficient? Prolates are actually ambush predators, so they just sit there till they see something and then they swim very quickly. So they can hunt fish. Uh, these are the box jellyfish and other things like that. Um, and so it does seem like they are when they do swim, it's at their resonant frequency. 
moon jellyfish, you know, usually they're just cruising along, eating as they go, a little plankton, and they do have oftentimes these long uh, periods between pulses where they're just cruising and eating. Okay, so let's look at turning, and I'll tell you for moon jellyfish, these oblates, how they turn. Different jellyfish turning is different, but for the oblates, what happens is that the inside of the turn contracts first, and the outside of the turn contracts last. The outside of the turn hyperextends, and the inside it contracts and it actually like holds the contraction while the outside is sort of flipping out like this. All right. And here's a snapshot. So this is starting, this is the inside of the turn, the beginning of the contraction. Here the outside is hyperextended. And so the pacemaker on the inside of the turn <coughs> fires first. So something has made these pacemakers decouple. Um, the turn starts as, so the coronal muscle here is getting activated first, and then later over on this side. And the radial muscles are thought to also be involved. So now the radial muscles are contracting first on the inside and being held for longer. But it was argued what their role was and if they were even really doing much of anything at all. Here is a movie of a jellyfish making a turn. This is the inside. And you might be able to see the inside of the turn contracts first and the outside hyperextends. Is there a pulse turn in the pacemaker when that happens between the inside and the outside or is it more continuous change around? I think it, de it depends. It can be sort of two will fire together followed by the rest, or it could be one and then like the inside and then these two and then those two. Um, and it's hard to measure these like when they're actually really doing the turn. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of variation and we're trying to sort that out a bit more as well. Okay, so um, there's also a lot of parameters that one can vary, and the duration of the contraction isn't really well known either. Uh, partially, again, because it's hard to measure all these things in a gelatinous jellyfish. So you could imagine that you have this contraction wave, and that active tension lasts for longer or shorter amounts of time. Okay, so that's a shorter duration and a longer duration might look like that. So that duration, just how long the active tension is applied, and you can get different types of turns. You can also vary this wave speed, which will be related to uh, how closely in time the pacemakers are firing. So when we first did this, we eventually got our jellyfish to turn and we were really happy, although it's not the best turn. But it did turn, <laughs> and it took a while. And so we showed this to our collaborators in bioshography, and they were like, oh, that looks like a dying jellyfish, and we're not like getting anything useful at all. So uh, we added and considered a couple of things. So one of them was um, the propagation speed of the activation, which again, uh, is really a rough metric for like how decoupled the pacemakers are. And um, so here is the wave speed, the change in angle during each pulse, which you can imagine this guy was straight up and down and then moved some angle of five. And so for a given elasticity, there is an optimal wave speed to generate the most turning. Um, in each pulse, and Alex has some preliminary results that suggest that, that when the wave speed of the elastic bell equals the wave speed of the activation, you get the biggest turn. Does your model impose like a discrete pacemaker system around, or is it kind of a continuous signal travel around? We've done both, okay. yeah, and I think the discrete pacemakers <laughs> give you a better turn as well. And we also added in radial muscles which we didn't have before. So those muscles on the inside will get activated and like hold the bell margin for longer. 
Um, and again, that was what they were speculated to do, but no one really knew for sure, nor was anyone able to record from those muscles like during an actual turn. So if we add, tune the wave speed to the elastic wave speed, we add the radial muscle. I think the jellyfish I'm about to show you has the discrete pacemakers. With all these things together, we get a much better turn. Okay, so um, there was a student who worked with John DeBerry, who's now at Stanford, who actually has been able to hook up electrodes to these moon jellyfish, and uh, is now both manipulating them and recording from them. And so here, the electrodes are desynchronizing the pacemakers and making the jellyfish turn. And so <laughs> hopefully, they can impose uh, pacemaker coupling or decoupling, and then we can do it in the jellyfish and then see do we get the same result. Okay, so moving towards this, uh, jellyfish always swim faster at their resonant frequencies, but maybe not in the most optimal way. So there's this interesting tuning between the mechanical properties of the bell and then the frequency of activation of the muscle. Um, this also occurs in the turn, so if the uh, wave speed of activation equals the elastic wave speed, you get a tighter turn. Some other questions we're looking at um, that are still in progress. Again, how do you take a spike train and then turn that into uh, force generation using both neuronal and uh, muscle models and then the coupling between them? And then how do you sort of uh, more sophisticated muscle models where you have force length and force velocity relations um, affect the performance. So now I have a quick part two that is shorter that's on pulsing corals. Um, and so there are a lot of different systems and I'll show you one jellyfish. These are upside down jellyfish that uh, sit on the bottom of the ocean and they have symbionts that photosynthesize, and as they pulse, they drive fluid through these oral arms that have a bunch of mouths and nematocysts. So if you're a zooplankton, you get pulled in, caught up in a vortex before you realize there's a jellyfish there, and then swept over these oral arms where you're like stung and trapped in mucus and you know. <laughs> and jellyfish are really good at doing this. Uh, but the pulsing behavior also perhaps mixes the water and enhances photosynthesis of the symbionts by um, getting rid of oxygen waste, actually, because the symbionts are doing uh, the majority of the work. Pulsing corals, <coughs> uh, which I more recently was introduced to that are in the Red Sea, it seems like they hardly eat anything at all. And uh, almost all of the motion is to enhance photosynthesis of the symbionts. And the photosynthesis uh, rates are enhanced up to an order of magnitude when they pulse versus when they don't. So the removal of oxygen from the tissues and the surrounding water by mixing up the boundary layer is really important. Um, so I guess some other comments. Uh, when corals bleach, they've ejected and lost their symbionts, which are really important. Um, sources of energy. And the pulsing corals, which are soft so they don't make up hard <coughs> reefs, are actually perhaps doing better in proliferating, whereas hard corals are dying off. So it's interesting to think about what advantages they might have um, over hard corals. Um, so all these guys, they form these large colonies, they pulse together and mix up the boundary layer and bees are another example of something that does this. And so bees line up in their hives and ventilate to uh, remove access or excess heat. Okay, so all these guys are like pumping together to upside downs, end up in these large carpets in the Caribbean and elsewhere. And um, so there are a lot of questions about it the group of them is mixing fluid more than uh, anyone could locally and so forth. 
So our project that started a couple of years ago, um, which is in collaboration with uh, Shilpa Khadri and Arsad, my student, Julia Sampson, uh, Roy Holtzman, and Harry Shavit, is uh, basically we go, Julia in particular goes to Israel and films and collects these guys. Here's a movie of them as well. And um, previously they had measured, sort of zoomed out and measured the flow rates when they were pulsing and not pulsing. And there are significantly more flow and mixing sort of at a zoomed out scale of meters. Uh, these guys are about a centimeter across. Uh, so there's a lot more flow when they're pulsing, but what does the flow look like more locally at the level of each individual polyp? And that's what uh, we have focused on for the past couple of years. So um, Julia has used particle image photosymmetry, and unfortunately there are all these glass beads you probably can't really see, but I'll show some velocity vectors later. So there's a up, continuous upward jet away from each of these polyp heads, and that's one feature. Um, but what is the general flow structure that's generated by each coral? No one had quantified that. Um, is it somehow special? So if you just take any plates and flap them together, would you generate an upper jet with the similar mixing features? Or is there something special about them? And then how does mixing the fluid enhance gas exchange? And are the polyps coordinated? And does that enhance flow in some ways? So I'll talk a little bit about the first three. The fourth question we're looking at, and I'll just say, if it's a huge colony, it doesn't seem like they're coordinated. So they aren't in sync, or they aren't exchanging information. They're just all pulsing at their own speed. But somehow there are enough of them that maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, if you have a smaller group like these four, there does seem to be some patterns. So it's interesting and not so easy to uh, decipher that. Um, but I'll tell you about the flow structure we found if it is just a function of having plates flat back and forth and what sort of regions that mixing is creating. So here is a single polyp. So you do actually find them not in a colony. So when they colonize a new area, there has to be one polyp that forms first. And uh, this is a pretty important stage uh, to colonize a new area. So this is what the flow looks like. So during the contraction, the fluid is ejected from between the tentacles. We have this strong upward jet. During expansion, fluid moves in and there's actually mixing, but we can't resolve the flow here because it, the laser optically, uh, it's not optically accessible. But you can see that there's still this upward jet and a separatrix where fluid here is moving up, fluid here is moving down and into the tentacles where it's mixing. And if you look at a bigger group, and these vectors aren't showing up well at all, but there is also a jet in a similar pattern. And I guess you'll have to trust me on that. <laughs> I think somewhere I have images with bigger vectors I'll have to buy. Oh. Are the polyps connected at the bottom of the, like a, the bottom of their stem or whatever you want to call it? Or so this is the laser uh, is illuminating a rock. And they are connected, but it's not, so it isn't like there's a stock and then each polyp is coming out of the stalk. It's like this, you're seeing part of the rock and they're connected, but they're each like. And, you know, sort of like that. Um, so there is a diffuse nervous system that runs between each of the polyps and they pro if you uh, poke at one, they all shut. So they are exchanging information in some way. Um, OK, so one of our ultimate goals is to construct a, a computational model of the polyp 
And to have uh, basically solve photosynthetic equations on each tentacle with oxygen being removed by the local flow. So this is something that Shelf is working on and we're far from having that right now. But you know, essentially, can we take this fluid structure interaction simulation and get the same flow patterns? Um, so to do this, we elected the motion of the tentacles and tracked it using a software from Tyco or the UNC, and then fit the positions over time with polynomials and average, so we had an average motion, and then moved the uh, flexible tentacles with the same preferred motion. And um, this is what that motion looks like. And again, so pulsing corals and jellyfish are both cnidarians. And so these guys, the predominant muscles, are the radial muscles that go up each tentacle. And there's also a coronal muscle down here, but I think that is mostly there to tuck in the tentacles. And so the pulsing is driven by the radial muscles, and they also have pacemakers. So it's a similar design. All right, so and here they are with the background flow field. So this is a vorticity plot, and you can see the velocity vectors. And hopefully you see there's an upward shed, um, and that during expansion, fluid moves down in between the tentacles and then just gets ejected up into that upward. Okay, so um, some of the features of this which are interesting and similar to the upside down jellyfish are that you do have flow moving in from the sides, slow regions of mixing and exchange between the tentacles, and then ultimately all the fluid gets pushed up and away. So you're constantly sampling new fluid as being pulled in from the sides, mixed, and ejected up. And uh, here we compared the vertical velocity across at different heights, averaged across these different lines, and the uh, flow towards the tentacle across these lines. And um, so the blue lines are the ones closest to the polyp. So we have on top, okay, these are the numerical results because they're clean, and these are the experiments. <laughs> I should probably label that, but anyway. Um, so if you look at this as the vertical, so what is the flow up? It's always positive at these different heights, and it gets up to about uh, 2.5 millimeters per second. Here, um, once we reach periodic steady state, it's always positive, always up, and gets, in this case, up to about two. <coughs> so we're doing a pretty good job. Um, we made a lot of simplifications in this model. You might notice these are feathery tentacles that we just treat them as solids and so forth. But qualitatively and quantitatively, we're doing very fairly well. And then the fluid is moving slowly towards the polyp. Okay. And, um, for the sake of time, I think I'll just show you one more big result. So these guys uh, are at Reynolds numbers of about 10. Most of the bees and the upside down jellyfish and the other things that collectively pulse to new fluids are usually at Reynolds numbers of 100 or above, so they're inertia dominated. These guys are the smallest things that I know that use this motion. They're right at the interface where viscous effects and inertial effects are significant. And if we drop down to a smaller Reynolds number, in the case of this polyp, <coughs> so you might see that the flow moves up and then the flow moves down. And there isn't this continuous upward jet. So we've got reversible flow. So if these guys are very much smaller, you wouldn't have this nice new fluid brought in, mixed, ejected up. It would just go up and down and you'd be sampling the same fluid over and over. And if you're bigger, so this is a Reynolds number of 80, you more or less get the same effect, but actually um, there's a lot of flow that slips in and out between the tentacles 
and the region of mixing between the tentacles is stronger, and it isn't quite the same nice pattern of bringing in new fluid, slowly mixing it, ejecting it up. So uh, these guys do seem to be tuned and doing very well for the scale that they're operating in. Um, and this is just showing you average uh, horizontal flow towards the coral and then vertical flow. The Reynolds numbers these guys are at are about <coughs> 10. So this is where uh, you can see there's no back flow, there's slow mixing, and it's always in one direction. If you drop down to lower Reynolds numbers, it goes up and down, up and down. Okay. Um, we've also done 2D simulations, and that doesn't capture this either. Okay, so um, what we've learned from them, so they have these sustained upward jets. During the expansion, you bring in new fluid, it slowly mixes, and you eject it, eject it upwards. And you can't just get this at different scales or by having different plates flopping around. So it does seem like they're making this particular mixing pattern for this particular scale. And then hopefully this enhances photosynthesis very well. But that's to be determined. Okay, so uh, lots of people to thank. And I guess I'll just point out that we have uh, collaborators in biology, uh, marine bio, bio engineering, math, physics, chemistry. So it's been really nice, uh, everyone bringing you know, a really different perspective and challenging everyone else uh, to do better work. So happy to answer any questions.